Okay, in this video I'm going to cover the infectious diseases that newborns typically get. Now, there are three basic ways that a newborn can get an infection. The infection could have been crossed over the placenta, something that the mom had. Uh, these are called, called the torch infections. It includes anything that can cross the placenta. Some of them are going to be from the bloodstream. Some of them are going to be considered ascending infections, meaning that they don't cross the bloodstream, but they go through the vagina up into the uterus and cross the placenta that way. You can also get infections uh, during delivery, so the vaginal canal is usually covered with a uh, different kind of bacteria. A lot of women, I think up to 30%, have uh, group B strep that colonize the vagina and vaginal canal, and uh, group B strep is pretty deadly to a newborn baby. And then after the baby's born, you can get in contact with a lot of different things. If he has a lot of brothers and sisters especially, then neonatal infections are also pretty common. So the reason these uh, transplacental infections are called torches or torch infections is because that's the acronym they spell out. So toxoplasmosis, rubella, uh, O stands for others, and you have cytomegalovirus, HIV, and then the spirochetes. Now, a precursory look at this list, and you'll see a lot of these things have something in common. So, for example, a rash. There's a blueberry rash in a lot of these diseases. There are also calcifications in a lot of these diseases. And then also hearing loss. So, if I were to look for anything in particular, I'd be looking for a blueberry muffin rash, calcifications, or deafness to identify these torches infections. A lot of these diseases have what is called the classical triad. So, for example, toxoplasmosis, the classical triad is chorioretinitis, intracranial calcifications, and hydrocephalus. Then you can have plus or minus on the blueberry muffin looking rash. The classic triad in rubella is a patent ductus arteriosus, deafness, and cataracts. Then for cytomegalovirus, the classic triad periventricular calcifications, hearing loss, and seizures. These last two don't have a classical triad, but it's good to just know that these are the symptoms that go with it. For example, if you have uh, HIV, I'm sorry, HSV, then you'll look for encephalitis and a herpetic lesion. And I say HIV because HIV could really go here as well, but the symptoms would be different. Most of the time, if a mother has a virus load less than 1,000, then a ba the baby's not going to get HIV, and usually the biggest risk is at delivery. So crossing the placenta, probably not, but maybe. Okay, risk factors, toxoplasmosis. This is a disease that finds most of its life cycle inside of felines, inside of cats. So if you eat a cat or if you eat raw meat. So raw meat's the other thing. And basically it has two species. Uh, parts of its life cycle. The first part is inside of the cat's stomach it, and then it turns into like a, a bradykeet and then to a tachykeet. I'm probably not even saying that right but just knowing that it has two parts to its life cycle and that it, the brady part is when you ingest it and then it turns into a tacky something and at that point it can infect any and every cell in your body. And that's why if an animal gets it, eating the raw animal meat puts you at risk for getting toxoplasmosis. With a rubella, it's just going to be are you around somebody else that has it. With uh, cytomegalovirus, the big risk is uh, sexual activity, but it can be in any of the uh, bodily fluids. And then HSV, if, you're, if the mom is seropositive, she has herpes, and that gets reactivated, that can be an issue. But more, than, more often, the issue is if it's a new herpes con, uh, infection, and that's going to be sexual contact or uh, any type of human contact with someone else that has the disease. And then speaking of sexual contact, I guess you can guess how you get syphilis. Now, on that acronym, TORCHES, there's the O for others, and I thought I would let you know what those others are, and I give you the little mnemonic, bacteria make people very ill. So Borrelia, Malaria, Parvovirus, B19, Varicella, Zoster, and Listeria. 
So let's start by talking about Borrelia. That's another spirochete, so it, it's kind of in the same family as Treponema, as syphilis. Uh, malaria, that is, uh, the biggest thing is if you're from sub-Saharan Africa, it really isn't transmitted in the United States, but you will see it in sometimes when a soldier returns from war, if they were in a, an endemic area, then they might have malaria as well. But on the case that you have somebody that's return, coming from sub-Saharan Africa, fever, chills, headache, malaysia, malaise, uh, anemia, and jaundice, those are going to be uh, some indicators. that Those are pretty nonspecific, so a lot of things cause that. But um, So you may want to do a workup on malaria, especially if they're pregnant. Now, listeria is one of the bell bacteria, so the bell meaning uh, B for group B strep, E for uh, E. coli, and L for listeria. Those are the three most common causes of meningitis in a young child. Listeriosis is pretty rare, but it does happen. Uh, whenever a baby contracts it, they can either uh, become septic or get meningitis from it. The outcomes, uh, being septic, has a worse, typically a worse outcome than uh, contracting the meningitis, however. Now with varicella zoster, that's basically chicken pox. It can spread from children that have chicken pox. It can also spread from people that have shingles. However, chicken pox is uh, highly, more uh, virulent, e more easily transmissible than, uh, than shingles is. And with the vaccines that started in 1995, uh, the occurrence of this has dropped quite a bit. So you probably won't even see it uh, in your practice if you do obstetrics. But um, anyhow, if it occurs and if a mother gets it in the first half of pregnancy, the infant is at risk of something called varicella syndrome, and it's basically highly teratogenic and causes a lot of birth defects. Now, parvovirus B19, you know this as fifth disease. Uh, it has a few other names that are more scientific and whatnot, but basically it looks like uh, someone, sm if a little kid gets it, most of the time kids get it, and by like teenage years, most people are immune to it. You've had it two or three times. But... You, whenever you get it, it looks like someone smacked you across your face. It's called the slap cheek rash. But if a baby gets it uh, well, before birth, then what can happen is they can have either a spontaneous abortion, which is pretty common with this, or high drops. High drops is basically extra fluid in any of the baby's compartments. So you have high drops fatalis, which means that there's there's fluid like edema in the skin, edema in the in the cranium, so cranial edema. Or um, there's other types of high drops, which include the placenta, which is um, bad but not as bad. And basically what this is, like if you were to look at the pathophysiology of it, it's the same as heart failure in adults. So whenever the heart isn't pumping right and the fluid homeostasis isn't right, then you get swelling, you get edema. So you look at a person with heart failure, you look at their feet, there's all kinds of puffiness and, and edema there. So think high drops fetalis think heart failure. And as long as you know the pathophysiology of heart failure, then you'll be able to remember that it's basically going to be edema. Now, a lot of these infections cause anemia. And so I don't know if it's easier for you to remember a list of things that each infection does or a list of infections that cause each symptom. Uh, so I'll try to give it both ways. So anemia, parvovirus B19. Why? Because it causes uh, blood, so it causes the, the cells to lice open. Malaria, same thing. So malaria, you have these, uh, these organisms living inside the red blood cell, and whenever they start dividing and multiplying, they'll break open and get out of the blood cell and just cause the blood cell to fall apart. Now, Hep B and Hep C, uh, you can not, they're more blood transmission than they are uh, considered as STDs. But getting it, period, you get it, it's part of the five H's. Group B strep, this is a streptococcus agalactiae. Again, sepsis and meningitis, it's a huge cause of meningitis in babies. 
Uh, mothers typically get checked around 35th or 36th week of pregnancy, and if they uh, they do a, a, a rectovaginal swab to check if there's group B strep around the rectum or around the vagina, if it comes up positive, they usually put them on prophylactic medication to kill the strep infection before they uh, deliver. And if that can't happen for any reason, then most of the time they're going to do um, a C-section. Then TB and mycoplasma. So these are other infections that you can get from the vaginal canal. So just uh, to be specific, TB is tuberculosis. I, I'm hoping everyone knows that. And just to be clear... TB is mycobacterium tuberculosis, and this is mycoplasma. So both of these things, don't, don't think I'm saying the same thing twice. Both mycobacteria and mycoplasma can cause an intrapartum infection. Now I want to go back really quick. With group B strep, there are time periods where different things are considered. So if, you, if a baby contracts group B strep within the first uh, 72 hours, then it is basically considered to be an intrapartum uh, infection. However, there's also something called early onset and late onset. So early onset is in the first seven days of life and late onset is after the, fir after the first seven days. So this is early, this is late. And early onset usually results in sepsis. Late onset usually results in meningitis. Those are not hard, fast rules. They're just rules of thumb. Now in the early days of the fetal life, HSV, a lot of people like to kiss babies. If you see a sore on their lip, don't let them touch your baby. And then staph infection, especially like uh, Staphylococcus aureus, pretty big deal. Uh, you don't want to get your baby around it, so keep that in mind. Okay, so we covered a lot of uh, different organisms. I was originally just going to do viruses, but I decided to do other things on this list as well. Um, so you have, I wanted just to make sure everyone is aware of the type. I think these are going to be testable on block exams. So Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoa. C uh, cytomegalovirus envelope double-stranded DNA, HSV double-stranded DNA, rubella single-stranded RNA. So you get the point. You can look at the list. You can pause it. Do your thing. Uh, point out real quick. Neisseria, of course I have over here gram-negative diplococci. And it's easier to remember that Neisseria is gram-negative because it is the easiest bacteria for complement to, to kill. So complement, whenever it is activated, it creates a membrane attack complex. And that membrane attack complex basically drills a hole into the bacterial cell wall. If you have a complement deficiency, then you are prone to Neisseria infections. And Neisseria, because they have the thinnest cell wall.